was going to talk then. I, someone was going to talk then. I cut them off. Who was that? I just put my microphone on. Okay. Um, I've had a... Today I woke up and I was okay. But for four days I've previous, I've had fluttering, very irregular heartbeat, got quite scared, didn't go to hospital. Um, I thought it would improve after the first day, so I didn't go to hospital and then it got a little better each day, so I thought it wasn't worth going in the sense that they wouldn't be able to test for what was actually going on. But I've been on edge, very scary, not sleeping well, and extremely exhausted after four days of it. So I'm very relieved today that my pulses, that I woke up, my pulse is regular. My blood pressure's not going all over the place. It seems like it was just a four day episode. Is that something? Um, you, is that something you 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 have? Is that, or has that just come out the blue? I, no, I've got a um, leaky bell, aortic bell, which yeah. I've had since I was three. It's only classed as mild, and I've had two episodes with my heart if in the last two years, probably, and they've only lasted for about eight hours. So I need to go and get my heart checked. I haven't had a check done for far too long. But um, And I'm aware that what set it off each time is emotion. And what, trig what triggered it this time? What emotion? Emotion. Anger. Um, got some issues happen with my son off and on. And he gets really angry and quite nasty. And instead of hanging up occasionally, I get caught up in it and I get angry back. And that's what happened on Wednesday night and this uh, Thursday morning. So, yeah. What's the insights you get from it? Apart from emotion setting it off and me not being able to always control. Often when he gets angry with me, I'm able to just stay in how much I love him hmm. and not get caught up in it. But I do get caught up in it occasionally. So, yeah. Have you been doing much practice, Judy? Not enough. <clears throat> Probably an hour a day, where a few months ago I was doing at least two hours a day plus. Still good, though. An hour a day is still good. Yeah, all good. I'll, uh, I'll keep you in my... Oh, everyone in this call, I, I include in all my, my practices anyway, but I'll, uh, I'll send blessings, Judy. Thank you so much. That's okay, mate. <clears throat> Love you all. So tonight looks like it's the, uh, we're going to get through, I'll just share my screen, the end of the Tao Te Ching tonight. And then I'm going to leave it up to you guys what, uh, what we can do after this, <clears throat> whether you guys want to do a different text or you want to go through some of the Tao books, the Tao 1 and 2. The Tao 1 and 2, there's about 40 books in each of those books. So, you know, I don't think we'd go over a page at a time, but I would definitely highlight, I'd definitely highlight some of the, the chapters or the, the important parts of the chapters, and we could work our way through some of the books. So I can, I can just leave that up to you guys, whatever you want to do. <clears throat> um. 
But yeah, I've really enjoyed the Dada Jing. The Dada Jing is a great text. I hope you've all enjoyed it. So, we get ready to receive. So as I said, we can make anything we do a universal practice. So dear, one Ling means all souls. We invite you to learn the wisdom of the Tao Te Ching. May it serve you all to move closer to the Tao. Dear all our ancestors, loved ones, Yuan Ling, Yuan, Y-U-A-N, Yuan Ling is all enlightened souls. Please be present. Please forgive us. Dear divine, dear the Tao. If you have a physical teacher, you can call them. All divine Tao transmissions, <clears throat> downloads, orders. Please turn on. The allowed all the Taoist lineages, please help us understand, digest, and absorb this um, classic text. We're very grateful. So, it's our soul power, mind power, see who we've invoked. And remember, Tao is the source, De is the blessing bestowed upon us from the source when we live in harmony with it. So, as we, we, uh, we go through the chapters, see the Tao bestowing its virtue on us, okay? So that we can embody it and uh, we can do our best, be more humble. <clears throat> okay, chapter 78. Nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water. Yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, Nothing can surpass it. The soft overcomes the hard. The gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. Therefore, the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. Evil cannot enter his heart because he has given up helping. He is people's greatest help. True words seem paradoxical. Breathe that in. Okay, breathe in the essence of that. Let it enter your Shen Chi Jing, your essence, and then exhale it to all beings. Nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water. <clears throat> we spoke about water, loudly refers to water a lot in this book because it is like the Tao in the manifested world. In the world of form, water is closest to the Tao. It doesn't know that it's great, therefore it's truly great. It serves all things. It gets used for everything. It flows in places men reject or people disdain, depending on the, uh, the text you're reading. <clears throat> goes to the low places. And it saves in the low places. So nothing is as soft and yielding as water. Yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. You think about huge rocks and mountain faces that are eroded by water over time. The soft overcomes the hard. The gentle overcomes the rigid. Again, my understanding of this it goes not just in the physical body, but also the, um, the mind, okay? A soft mind, a gent gentle nature overcomes the rigid and the hard. Uh, it's funny, I was talking to Fletcher. I think Fletcher's on the line <clears throat> at the minute. So there he is. I talking to Fletcher the other day about my, uh, in England, one of my jujitsu coaches. He, uh, I was, you know, try, obviously I didn't, when I started, I didn't know any techniques really. So I was just trying to overpower people. And he was a great uh, jujitsu specialist. And he was literally like a dead body. He would just hold my wrist really gentle. And I'd be trying to do this, that, and the other, I'd be sweating. And he'd just be really soft, gently changing positions. And then he'd just be setting me up. And then he'd put me in like an armbar or a choke. 
And he's such a good teacher because rather than really cranking me and trying to break my arm, he would get me in, in it. And then he'd say, right, this is how you defend it. And this is how I, I did what I did. So I, you learn very fast with someone like that. But he was definitely a very soft, gentle uh, master, if you like, of jujitsu. And he was a black belt. He's incredible. <clears throat> so, and this goes for our mind as well. Okay. How many times have we seen people ready for a fight? You know, I'm going to share a story. It's a very sad story, but it really moved my heart. I, I, I had a friend in England, and he was telling me that his 15-year-old daughter, uh, they didn't know, him and, his mom, him and his wife didn't know, but his 15-year-old daughter wrote a suicide note because she was getting bullied by a girl at school. And uh, she ended up opening, they saw the letter and she ended up opening up and she said, this girl's made my life hell for, for years. I'm sure if I'm saying this, this story because it just comes to mind. And uh, so my mate, obviously hot-headed, um, he's not a hot-headed person, but he was just raging. And he said to me, he said, Nick, I just went round to the, the girl's house. And he said, my, my mind was, my mindset was, I'm going to tell her that what his daughter's done to my daughter. And if he's not interested, I'm going to beat him up. That's where his mind was at. And uh, he said, he walked around, he knocked on the door. He said, the, 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 girl, the girl's father opened the door and he said, he was ra raging. And he said, he opened up and said, this is what your daughter's been this is doing to my daughter. She's wrote a suicide note, blah, blah, blah. And he said, the girl's father just gave him a hug and started crying. And he said the two of them just held each other and they just sobbed into each other's uh, arms. And he said, the girl's father just said, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. He said, I will sort it out. We'll get it sorted out. And he said, you know, they ended up becoming friends and what have you. But, you know, this just came into my mind just then, just going over this text because, you know, sometimes we have an idea that, that we're going to just do this. And as soon as there's an apology there, uh, the soft and gentle overcomes the hard and the rigid. <clears throat> Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. Therefore, the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. Reflect on that. Serene in the midst of sorrow. There's a deeper understanding than just what goes on in the physical world, okay? And the master is aware of that. He's aware of impermanence. He's aware of the nature of uh, emptiness, okay? He's aware of the, 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 the Tao as well as the manifested world. So he's always serene. He's unshaken. He's detached. Evil can not enter his heart. Because he has given, given up helping, he is the people's greatest help. Again, like I'm, I'm sure you guys have got deeper insights into this, but uh, and I'd love to hear them. But you know, I just think uh, the difference between the ego and just being the condition. The ego is always trying to help. Okay, the ego, or it's either, it's always needs drama. So the fact that he's given up that. He is just the condition. He is serene. So another story that's just come to me, Thich Nhat Hanh shared the story of a, um, a story of where pirates came on board a, a ship and they, they, they basically they mugged everyone. They beat people up and all the rest of it. And the, the reason why I'm sharing that story is Thich Nhat Hanh said, it would have only taken one person to have stayed serene and grounded and peaceful. And, and, and not get disrupted in that environment. And they would have been an anchor for other people. They would have been an example. They would have settled everyone down. You think about um, when, when there's chaos, it's very rare you see people who can stay still and detached in those, uh, in those moments. And that's why these people's greatest help. True words seem paradoxical. So I'll open it up to whoever wants to share. Okay. 
79. <clears throat> yes. Yep. Your last story reminds me so much of what I've just been going through, not staying calm with my son <laughs> and then suffering because of it. Um, yeah, and there was something else that hit me. I've just lost it. My head's not real clear at the moment. Um, about water and being soft and coming the softness being above the hardness. And I'm working on my, um, oh, sorry, my head's not in a real good place. Um, I'm working on my lymphatic system at the moment mm -hmm. and reading a lot about it. There's a lot of new information on the lymphatic system at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it talks about it being blocked. And in, in the case where the lymphatic system is blocked, it's water that's turned hard in a, in a sense, not completely hard, but it's hard enough to block an area. Um, so the water itself, instead of remaining soft, has become hard. And my thinking's not going beyond that. That apart from the water that is blocked behind the blockage is soft enough to push through that blockage with the right, in inverted commas, um, ways of doing so. Yeah, haven't gone any further than that. And the <laughs> paradox, re reading these chapters, the, the paradox is what often comes to me between the different things that are said sometimes in the one chapter. Thank you. Great, no, thank you. It's a great, great insight. It's a great insight. You know, you uh, because your the water in the body and the body uh, responds to our emotions. So if you're rigid in your mindset or you're always angry, it affects the body, the body tightens up, water can't flow freely in the body, it's stagnation and leads to, to, to sickness. So that was a good insight. Anyone else want to share on that or we go to 79? Yeah, I'll share, Nick. I'll share on 78 if I can. Yeah, yeah I'll just put it back up for you, bud. Thanks, Les. Um, You can hear me okay? Perfect. I can anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. Uh, after our conversation today, I was listening to Dharma Pada in the car in yoga and um, the soft overcomes the hard, the gentle overcomes the rigid. It's very similar to in the Dharma Pada. Well, it's the same as in the Dharma Pada where Buddha is said to have said, um, love, sorry, hate never dispelled hate. Only love dispels hate. Mm -hmm. um, and also the lines there, therefore the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. And it reminded me that Often, true masters seem seem crazy uh, and completely misunderstood, and they have that serenity in the midst of the world, which to them is totally crazy and insane. But to the average man, is not the midst of sorrow; it's just the world. Um, so there's the paradox there. But also, the last line I think is very profound as well because true words seem paradoxical. Um, and that's it reminds me of the first line of the Tao Te Ching where the true Tao cannot be named. Um, and it's often that, you know, words are used to kind of point us back towards the truth when they're used correctly. So they, they're approached or directing you towards the truth from all angles. So naturally they're going to contradict each other. And it reminded me of the story which you first told me about um buddha when he gives a sermon and someone comes up to him after and asks um buddha is there a god and he says no there is no god and then the next man comes along and asks buddha is there a god he asks the same question he says yes there is a god and then ananda i think it's ananda uh, yeah, his yeah. right hand man 
to you know what was that about he just told one man the other and and, and one man the total opposite be lying um i'm just paraphrasing the story here obviously yeah. um but to me, what I get from that is that Buddha, you know, the great master, Shijamani Fu, that walked the earth, he was the embodiment of um, everything we read here in chapter 78. And he gave those two people, he could see exactly what those two people needed to, to hear and see in order to get over their blockages and, and reach, reach down, which is what this book is pointing towards. Um, Include Melanda. Including Ananda, yeah, that's right, exactly. He sees the whole situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it's like it's a, it's an opening, opening up to the truth that words can help with. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because life is paradoxical. Uh, without, uh, <clears throat> I heard our show say once. I think he, was, he said, you know, without the uh, England invade in India, you wouldn't have uh, the British. You wouldn't have Gandhi. And he said that's why he purposely contradicted himself, Osho. Um, he said, because everything's always in flux, everything's always changing. How I see the world today is going to be different tomorrow. So, yeah, a true master embodies the, 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 the paradoxical, paradoxical nature of nature. I Seven. have a story to share, Nick, if you'd yes. like. Yep, yeah. yeah. Um, I, it just reminded me of something that happened at one of the um, the teenager camps that we had. And uh, one of the um, coaches came up to me and said, we've got it. I've got a boy in my group and I think there's something um, not quite right. She's absolutely fine. I can deal with it. I just need to know what it is. So I looked up. He was a 16 year old boy and he, he was um, on the spectrum. And I told her and she said, that's absolutely fine. She said, I can deal with it. And then the next morning she came up to me and she said, I have to tell you what happened this morning. She said, they were all in there in, in the team and everyone was um, sitting around and we were you know, taking notes on things. And she said, he came in and he, he could be very disruptive. And he was in everyone's face saying, I hate you, I hate you. And she said, I didn't say a word. She said, as one, they put down their notebooks and their pens and they got up and they hugged him. And she's telling me, and I've got tears in my eyes now because you know we both had tears. She said, it was amazing. Yeah, she well, said, yeah. I didn't say a word and that was their reaction. How beautiful. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Love them stories. Just one second, just gonna let the dogs out. Sorry. Yeah, beautiful story. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, 79. Failure is an opportunity. If you blame someone else, there is no end to the blame. Therefore, the master fulfills her own obligations and corrects her own mistakes. She does what she needs to Sorry, she does what she needs to do and demands nothing of others. It's a great teaching for everyone. Failure is an opportunity, the nature of yin yang. Uh, I even heard, like, I, I think it was, a, uh, oh, you know, I think it was even someone like Will Smith. He said something about failure. He was saying, you know, when you train a muscle, you, your muscle will grow when you, when you train it to failure. So, you, you know, you think, Failure of the muscle is getting it stronger. So failure is an opportunity. I think in, in today's world, so many people are afraid of failing in anything they do. Therefore, they never achieve anything. If you blame someone else, there's no end to the blame. Uh, beautiful. You know, if there's ever... It's good being around kids, actually, when kids start blaming. They can't let go of, uh, of, of, of the blame. There's, there's no end to it. Therefore, the master fulfills their own obligations and corrects their own mistakes. She does what she needs to do and demands nothing of others. We can only control our own energy and awareness. Therefore, I often think when people have asked me, what is a master? I say, someone who's mastered themselves. 
Yeah, so yeah, beautiful. Anyone wants to share anything on that? Pretty straightforward. But if anyone wants to share any insights or stories, please do. I'll share again, Nick, if no one else wants to jump in. Yeah, mate. Thank you. Um, the first line was very potent for me. Failure is an opportunity. I've noticed in myself that I have the biggest struggles when I begin to blame and it's so easy to blame. You can blame on so many different different levels. Um, and then I was reminded in meditation, I shared with you, Nick, um, of the lotus flower. And we all know the lotus flower, how the lotus flower emerges from mud. But then I really thought about that. I thought about how the lotus flower actually draws its nutrients from the muddy water, from the dirty water. And then I thought about the world and I was like, it's the moments that we fail um, or we slip up. We don't meet expectations, however you want to put it, that we grow from that and we move towards the light. We move towards our inner knowing and a deeper understanding of ourselves. And it's when we embrace that as an opportunity that we grow. Um, but yeah, I got a lot from you just saying the simple words there, Nick, saying there is no end to blame because I'd never, I'd never actually considered that, believe it or not, that it is endless blaming. Um, and it's also one other thing I'll share is I was watching a, a business podcast and an insight came to me. It was a, a an ex-Formula One driver, so an ex-race car driver, very successful, called Nico Rosberg. I think he may have been world champ at one stage, I'm not sure. And then he was interviewing on his podcast uh, a team manager. Um, and the team managers of these F1 teams are, you know, very high-functioning individuals. Um, it's a sort of supreme job in, business, in the business world and it takes understanding of Formula One and also business. Um, so, you know, this is a fairly high-level conversation if you're into business and high performance, which I'm not so much, but I was just listening to it. Um, and I realized in listening to them that by just listening to them and observing them, they took responsibility for every single aspect of their life. So on one level, it was very egoic, but it was also the level of admiration to it as well, because at not one point in the interview did either of them ever blame anyone else for anything that happened in their life. They took it as an opportunity to grow and succeed in what they saw as success. I thought it was a very good lesson. Um, so, yeah, I was just reminded of the muddy water and the lotus. And if you use the world as a tool for your spiritual growth, um, it's magnificent and it continues to unfold for you endlessly. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. It's funny after you shared that insight on uh, the lotus flower with me the other day, I noticed that Tick That Hands actually wrote a book called No Mud, No Lotus. Yeah, I haven't read it, but I think it'd be one to, to, to read. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. There's a great story, which probably everyone's heard of, but, you know, I was um, teach this to my granddaughter as well, that, you know, you can't have um, success without having failure. You know, you're going to have lots of failures because that's when you learn. And it was um, the story of Thomas um, Edison, who invented the light bulb. And he had done something like 1,100 experiments. And the reporter came up and said, Mr. Edison, you know, when are you going to give up? You know, you've tried this uh, 1,100 times and you still haven't invented anything. And he said, no, no, I've just found 1,100 ways of not doing it. But, you know, I'll keep going and eventually I'll get it. <laughs> so that's, that's a really good story. It's a great story. It's a great story. That's awesome. And thanks for sharing. Um, I heard a friend of mine once say um, about if, if a couple have a divorce, two people separate, you always hear people say, oh, you know, I'll take 50% of the responsibility. But she said to me once, she said, in a, in a divorce or in a breakup, both parties should take 100% responsibility. And I, I don't know, I got a lot from that. Just thought I'd share it. Okay, 80 Come back to the lower dantian, breathe into the lower dantian, ground ourselves. If a country is governed wisely, its inhabitants will be content. They enjoy the labor of their hands and don't waste time inventing labor saving machines. 
Since they dearly love their homes, they aren't interested in travel. There may be a few wagons and boats, but these don't go anywhere. There may be an arsenal of weapons, but no one ever uses them. People enjoy their food, take pleasure in being with their families, spend weekends working in their gardens, delight in the doings of the neighborhood. And even though the next country is so close that people can hear its roosters crowing and its dogs barking, they are content to die of old age without ever having gone to see it. You know, Lao Tzu is very much uh, of the belief or the understanding that everybody should just be happy and content. Uh, you know, it's a Buddhist teaching, Thich Nhat Han used to say uh, to his students, if he saw someone, he said, where are you now? And he said, if they answered him, they were not in the present moment. If they said, oh, I'm here, or I've just been thinking about this or whatever, he said, if a student just smiled, they were present. If a country is governed wisely, its inhabitants will be content. Again, it's this, uh, he's pointed a few times throughout the book on um, if you're going to govern, how to govern wisely, basically. Leave the people alone. Trust them. The more you, you bother them, the more you create this disease and disorder. So if a, if a country is governed wisely in harmony with the Tao, its inhabitants will be content. They enjoy the labor of their hands and don't waste time inventing labor-saving machines. They're present. They're in with the community. You know, there's a story, I don't know whether it's a true story, but and I may have shared this early on in, in these Tao uh, <clears throat> Te Ching sessions, but Lao Tzu was asked um, to sentence people and he said, this is not a job for me. And they said, no, please, please, you're the wise man of the, the village and the land. Please, uh, can you be in the courtroom and sentence people? And the first hearing that he went into was a rich man who'd gathered a lot of gold and horses, and a, a thief had stole one of his horses and stole his gold. And when it became time to get sentenced, Lao Tzu said, I sentence the gentleman who's, who uh, had his gold stolen. I sentence him to six years. So everyone was up in arms and they said, you can't do that. He said, I told you I'm not the man for the job. They said, you can't do that. He's, he's the victim here. The other guy is stole from me. He said, okay, then I give them both three years each. And they said, you can't do that. Why are you doing that? And he said, if this gentleman had not collected all the gold, he would not have created a thief. So this idea, this image that for me that this chapter creates in my mind is just everyone lives where they live and they're content. They're not bothered because people are fundamentally good. Since they dearly love their homes, and I'm sure they're not uh, glamorous homes, they, are, they, are in, they aren't interested in travel. There may be a few wagons and boats, but they don't go anywhere. There may be an arsenal of weapons, but no one ever uses them. That's a powerful sentence because no one needs to. If the whole world follows the Tao, there's never a threat. You think about turning your news off. Okay, the news just keeps us distracted of what's, what they want us to think is going on in the world. But literally, if the whole world switched off all news, all social media, and stop reading the news. The world is not a bad place. They need the people's participation in feeding the collective drama. But there's no threat. But there's no threat. Even, even guys that I've worked with who are like big beer drinking, um, 
you know, barbecue on the weekend and whatever you typical Aussie males, whenever I've spoke to them, they've always said to me, Man, I just want a peaceful life. People just want a peaceful life. So if nobody's putting, no one's feeling threatened, no one's going to create drama. People enjoy their food, take pleasure in being with their families, spend weekends working in their gardens, delight in the doings of the neighborhood. And even though the next country is so close that people can hear its roosters crowing and its dogs barking, they are content to die of old age without ever having gone to see it. Does anyone want to share on that? <clears throat> Even if you don't want to share, that's totally fine, but just visualize that. You know, so many people at the minute saying they want to go and get land and they want to do this and they want to do that. Why? Why do you think you want to do that? What is it in you that is drawn to going back to the simple simplicity of, of nature and living on the land? Okay, it's, last. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yep. I'll just mention quickly the, the line that came to mind was, um, again, paraphrasing, but uh when the master travels he never leaves his home and that's uh that's also a lot of people today looking for where they fit in society and what their roles are and when you're truly home within your heart or within your body or within your being your role emerges and those questions fall away um so yeah it's this constant need to travel and consume and look outside that causes disease not only in ourselves, but inevitably in society as well. They're one and the same. Um, yeah, so I just thought I'd share that line because it came to mind. Thank you. Just you sharing as well just reminded me of the Tibetan story of the, the donkey that can smell a pheromone of, the, of its mate and basically travels its whole life trying to find the, the female partner that it can smell. Uh, even though the pheromone is being released by himself, doesn't know it's coming from within him. And it's used in a, as a Buddhist teaching in Tibet because that's fundamentally what we do. We search everywhere outside. We search, we search, we search, and we miss. Even the actual uh, introduction to this version of the Tao Te Ching, uh, Stephen Mitchell says, the Tao is so simple that every child understands it. It's right under our noses. It's right here, right now. So yeah, thanks for sharing, Fletcher. I might just quickly share if you can hear me, Nick. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Sylvana. I just uh, symbolically, I find this very interesting. Like, um, like the verse um, uh, says, you know, um, in contentment, we want to stay in our community. We want to stay in our home. We want to be in our gardens. We want to eat locally. I mean. Um, it just shows just how much um, this harmony we have within our own communities. Everybody wants to travel. Everybody wants to go somewhere to feel happy because we've forgotten how to be happy in our own environment. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. People, pe pe people, especially in England, you know, Danielle, my wife, she always talks about it. It's like she said her, her memories of her dad. <laughs> who used to really suffer in the winter. He used to love it when the sun was out. But, a, you know, a typical English family where we grew up anyway, um, they just complain and are miserable all year round and are happy for two weeks of the year when they go on, on holiday. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty sad. 81. Final chapter. I love this as one of my favorite lines in the whole text. True words aren't eloquent. Eloquent words aren't true. Wise men don't need to prove their point. Men who need to prove their point aren't wise. The master has no possessions. 
The more he does for others, the happier he is. The more he gives to others, the wealthier he is. When thou nourishes by not forcing, by not dominating, the master leads. That's literally one of my favorite, probably my favorite uh, chapter. True words aren't eloquent. Eloquent words aren't true. But the text uh, say wise words. Wise words aren't eloquent. Eloquent words aren't wise. Could actually be this text. That might be a misprint from the, from the PDF that I, I copied it from. But um, wise words aren't eloquent. He says early on in earlier chapters, he says, words that point to the Tao are monotonous and without flavor. Okay. If the Tao is not flamboyant, it's not, it's not dramatic. It's everywhere. It's, this is why in Buddhism, I love uh, hearing Chogram Trumpa in uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. My, what I took from that book is that True sacredness is actually in the mundane. In the mundane, when you see, understand the nature of dependence arising and, and emptiness, you see that what we think is just a board and table, for example. If you see it through the eyes of an enlightened being or an understanding of dependence arising, you see the tree the table came from, the idea that came into the designer's head and everything that's interconnected with it. And that way you're always content with anything that's going on in your life. And that's true beauty. But words, uh, wise words are not eloquent. Eloquent words aren't wise or true. Wise men don't need to prove their point. Men who need to prove their point aren't wise. It's a story that gets repeated a lot and shared a lot, but it's beautiful, is the, the Zen story of Is That So? I've probably shared it multiple times in these sessions, but it just that's what comes to mind. A great Zen master, well-respected in his village, a young, uh, a young daughter of a family who were a devotee of the Zen master, she fell pregnant. And uh, when the parents found out, um, she, they said, who's the father? And she said, the, it's the Zen master. I think it's Harquin, that one. And um, when the baby's born, they take the baby to the Zen master. They bang on the door. They say, you're a disgrace. Here's, you, you know, you, you impregnated our daughter. Here's the baby. And all he said was, is that so? And he took the baby on and he was disgraced. So people would spit at him in the street because he, um, you know, he was a disgrace to the temple and whatever. And then the young lady couldn't handle what she'd done. And after 12 or 18 months, she said to her parents, it wasn't, it was the son of the fishmonger. And they came back and begged for forgiveness and said, we're so sorry, you're not the father. Can we take the baby back? Which he did. He handed over the baby, nurtured the baby for 12 months. And all he said was, is that so? He's a wise man. Master Shah shares that story and he says, he's not in human thinking. This is what Master Shah is really emphasizing at the moment. Drop human thinking. Stop trying to prove your point. Stop blaming people there's no end to the bitter sea the, the human drama there's no end to it there's no end to the blame you don't have to prove your point people who have to prove their point aren't wise the master has no possessions there's a beautiful zen story of a great master called ryokan someone broke into his hut and uh, to steal from him and there was, there was nothing in there. And it, it woke uh, Master Ryokin up. And he said, oh, you've traveled so far. Please don't go empty-handed. And Ryokin took his, his, his uh, robe off and he gave it to him. 
and the, the, the thief was, didn't have a clue what was going on and just sort of went off into the hills and Ryokan stood, uh, sat under the moon and he said, poor fellow, I wish I could give him this beautiful moon. The master has no possessions. Take all my clothes, I'll just stay naked. The more he does for others, the happier he is. True happiness comes from contribution. The more he gives to others, the wealthier he is. Remember in earlier chapters, when you have enough, you know you have enough, you are truly fulfilled. The Tao nourishes by not forcing. Nature doesn't force anything. By not dominating, the master leads. I think that last uh, chapter really sums up the whole book. I'd love to hear anyone share their insights into that chapter. I think there's um, a really good point when, you know, it's about, um, you know, trying to prove your point, trying to prove it that you're right. That, you know, you can, there's a thought that always comes to me, you know, do you want to be kind or do you want to be right? Because sometimes, you know, to prove your point, you have to put that person down. So if you'd rather be kind, then you don't need to prove your point. I find that really fascinating that you share that because I, I've been listening to a, a Buddhist text today and as much as I've heard it over and over and over again about love and kindness and compassion, the book mm -hmm. I'm reading at the minute is how to choose a guru like, like, and how to basically how to distinguish a genuine guru or not. And uh, he just keeps repeating in the book how kindness is, is, is so important. And I just thought to myself, how, you know, you hear love and kindness from Buddhism, but it's just so simple. You know what I mean? Be kind and change the world. Yeah. Kindness is just so, so uh, powerful and so important. So just well, thanks for sharing that. It's lovely. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll share just on that uh, that line there. I suppose because um, uh, yeah, the wise men, wise men don't need to prove their point. Men who need to prove their point aren't wise. And then uh, you and I'm sorry, I haven't, I'm on my phone, so I'm not looking at names. But whoever shared with Nick, um, made it raised a very good point about kindness. Jules, Julie, Ju Jules, thanks for that, or Julie. Um, and it's the, I suppose, yeah, words don't do it justice, but the ubiquity of kindness, which leads to compassion, which leads to understanding is far beyond and far greater than any words, the weight any words will ever hold. So it's the action of being kind. You can be kind by using words, but often the kindest thing to do is, is not speak in so many circumstances and, and let people navigate the world they need to the way they need to navigate the world um but I, I know we mentioned it last week and i mentioned it to nick a few times in the past week but all these chapters for me anyway they always point you back within yourself so if they're always pointing you back within yourself then the answers are, are within um and I, when we speak so much we're expending energy outward and i often find that that's that's us describing what's what we believe to be true, but really what is true is inherent. Um, and kindness is the action of acknowledging the inherent in all things. So, yeah, it's a powerful practice, just being kind. It's the most simple thing, isn't it? Beautiful. Awesome. It's also realising that, you know, often our programming is what takes over. Because if you've come from a family where you know, everyone in it usually comes from one or both parents, they have to be right. And um, 
I remember my, you know, my dad always had to be right. And then that, that comes through you as well until you recognize that you're doing it and you can interrupt that pattern, that programming pattern. Because I see that quite a lot as well in different, different people. I think it's a dad thing, Jules. <laughs> well, it's also been a pattern that we've watched play out on the global front for the last couple of years everybody trying to be right everybody their way is the right way whichever way it is and it's been it's just separated so many people beautiful i agree all good can i just share uh, very quickly and um, 81 um there's two aspects to it because really the the beginning um uh, talking about um it's really saying um no one likes to hear the truth you know because the truth somehow hits us on a vibration that you know sometimes when we're not ready to hear it um you know that's why it's not eloquent that's why it's not always what we want to hear we're often you know a very charming person or someone who's trying to um uh, tell you a story um often can you know they play riddles a bit like we see on our televisions but um so there's the aspect here of drop the ego and um, drop the possessions and you know stand in 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 your truth stand in love so it really has um, a lot of depth in this 81 thank you and thanks for sharing it's great insights because when you say we don't want to hear the truth it's only the ego that doesn't want to hear the truth and it's actually only the ego that finds uh, it's drawn to eloquent and charming words um, so yeah, beautiful insight. Thank you all for sharing. I'll just open it up. Does anybody have anything they want to go from this this point on? I mean, we can we can uh, obviously we're going to do a practice before we finish, but uh, you know, would you rather go over like some of a Master Sha Dao book? Would you rather do another text like the Dhammapada? Dhammapada is a very very deep text. And, and Thomas Byron's version is very short as well. It's similar to the Tao Te Ching. It's not it's about the same length as the, as the Tao Te Ching. Um, or we can go over, as I say, the Tao 1, Tao 2, or whatever. I'll leave it up to you guys. I'd like to go for the Tao 1 and Tao 2. They're two of the books I don't have. But I'm reading um, a number of, of uh, books um, by Master Shah. So I think that would be really useful. Nice. Okay, we'll start the Tao one. The good thing with Master Shah books, and I'm glad you said that, because I mean, there's no reason why we could ever end these. We can keep these going forever. Um, but Master Shah's books are full of practices anyway. So I mean, even if we go over a, a section of the Tao one, um, Master Shah emphasizes in all his books. One of his books is like being in a workshop with him. It's fifty percent theory, fifty percent practice. So to actually go through and, and, and explain the essence of certain parts of the book and then do the practice, you really are going to get the most out of, out of the, the text. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to, to be honoured enough to, to share the Tao one with you guys. Sounds fabulous. Thank you. All good. All good. It um, is fabulous. I bought the books. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good. It's funny because audio books are, are quite good with the Dao One book, but and Dao Two, but they can be quite a because it, it, the English explains some of the Chinese. Some people find them quite hard to get through, so it'll be, hopefully it'll be easier when we're doing it all together. All good. <clears throat> Let's find a mantra. That's all right. Let's see what I've got. I might do another Om Mani Padme Aum this week, and then we'll focus on some of the Tao texts for next week. Because um, yeah, some of the Tao texts are deep. You'll be learning some Chinese, and Om Mani Padme Aum is very, very powerful. So <clears throat> I get everyone to just start settling yourselves and getting into the condition now, and just bring your awareness to your breath. Here we go. We play this one. This is a lovely one. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so both hands over your lower abdomen. Put them in the yin yang palm position. So I've shared this is a very powerful position. Remember, simple teaching Tao creates yin yang. Yin yang melds as one, returns back to the Tao. That is really summing up the Tao normal and reverse, reverse creation, as simple as you can explain it. So the yin yang palm position. This is why if we understand yin-yang, nature in life, Master Shah says in one of his calligraphy videos, he says, yin-yang principle is everything. You look at the Ibiza calligraphy, pressure, less pressure, pressure, less pressure, yin-yang alternation, okay? You understand yin-yang, you're going through a hard time, okay, you be patient, you be grateful, what follows hard times? Good times. Okay. You have good times. Don't get too attached to them. <laughs> what follows good times? Hard times. So the yin yang palm position is literally to balance yin yang within your body and within uh, one ling. So the yin yang palm position is very, very powerful palm position. Okay. So, and what we can do with this is this is old school. He doesn't teach this that much anymore, but this is an old school technique. Okay. Left hand, right hand grabs your left thumb, hand goes over, and then you're going to put this knuckle, your right knuckle, into your belly button, and then roll it down until it just falls naturally. That's over your lower dantian. Now what you're going to do is, throughout the practice, when you think on, is you're going to alternate between squeezing. This is what he doesn't teach that often anymore. It was an old school uh, technique. It's very powerful. You're going to squeeze your hands in the yin yang palm position to like 80% strength and then release. Squeeze and then release. And it doesn't matter how long you hold them for, if they're short, if, even if they're fast, because even if you're holding it tight for a while, loose for a while, tight for a while, loose for a while, or you are tight, loose, tight, loose, tight, loose, tight, loose, tight. Loose. That's a yin-yang alternation. Yin-yang alternation can be a split infinite times, okay? So be flexible, but this actually generates a lot of energy for your lower dantian, okay? So dear Guan Yin Ling Wei Sheng Shi, the 87 Buddhas of the Da Beijo, the Ami Tofu, Da Shijapusa, Shijamoni Fu, Yao Shifu, Wen Shifu, Dizang Mang Pusa, all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Jesus, Mother Mary, all holy saints, Lao Tzu, Chuang Tzu, Liai Tzu, Pudi Lao Tzu, five, sorry, eight Taoist immortals, all the Taoist masters, Ah Lang, Jim Fa Sheng Shi, all the heavens, top generals, or Akashic record workers, keepers, and leaders. Ascended masters, lamas, gurujis, kahunas, elders, rinpoches, tukus, ancestors, tian di ren, heaven, mother earth, humanity. Nature, the present moment. Every soul of our being, a body soul, original soul, a Tian Ming, a heaven's task, a Chung Mai center channel, a yin yang energy circles within the body, acupuncture points, meridian lines, systems, organ cells, DNA, RNA spaces, five elements, every part of our being. All beings, we love you, we honor you, we appreciate you. We invite you to this practice. Dear the soul of Poppy and her family, Lachlan, Cheryl's uh, father-in-law, and I give you all a couple of minutes to just be a soul, mind, body of whoever you want to invite to this meditation. See them come. See them sit with us and the higher saints, the divine, the Tao, physical teacher, name them if you have one. Anyone that's ever chanted Wong Mani Bama Hong.
mind power, see these souls, see the light nourishing us, healing us, uplifting us, enlightening us, and then shining out to all beings, to nature. I'm going to mute myself. Sound power, what you chant is what you become. As you alternate your hands, also alternate chanting out loud. Chant out loud, chant silently. Chant out loud, chant silently. Chanting out loud vibrates the bigger spaces of the body. Chanting silently stimulates the smaller spaces. Om Mani Padme Om Mani Padme Om Mani Padme Om Mani Padme Om Mani Padme
and just sitting with that frequency. We're gonna just use our mind power <clears throat> before we do a quick blessing. So visualize the infinite pure lands of Buddhism. Countless enlightened beings, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, doing Shulian in Ami Tofu's pure land. All chanting Om Mani Padme Hum. An infinite number of enlightened beings chanting Om Mani Padme Hum. Like a universal chanting choir. Ami Tofu, huge in the far distance. With Guan Yin to his right as we see him. Dashijapusa to his left, as we see him. Incredible light beings. Also becoming aware of all the beings that have ever chanted this mantra and who chant this on earth. All the monks and the masters all over this. Earth, chat no money by me. All Buddhas in the ten directions, chat no money by me. The enlightenment mantra. Now see everything we can see come to our lower dantian. Observe the same. Observation, but in our lower dance here. Anyone on the line that has Tao hands or any other spiritual transmissions, they get approval to turn on. As appropriate, please bless everyone on the line's lower dance here. See infinite light in the lower dantian. And this is nourishing the first soul house, snow mountain, Ning Men, and the Jung Mai, the central channel. The incredible light. Strengthening our roots, our foundation. So we are solid like a mountain in our foundation. Heart as open as the sky. Mind empty. Now see all the pure lands, all the Buddhas, all the holy beings leaving our lower dantian. Feel the frequency that's left. Feel the body. And drop everything. Drop every visualization there. And just be. Just observe how you feel. Allow that frequency 
to naturally make us grateful and compassionate. <clears throat> When you're ready, put your hands in the traditional prayer position. We say, thank you, Lao Tzu, for writing the Tao Te Ching and leaving such a gem to humanity. Thank you to the soul of every word, every sentence, every space in between the words, every chapter, to the whole text. May we continue to learn, digest, and absorb the wisdom. May we find this text in future lives so that we can save others with it. Thank you to Guan Yin, Amitofu, Dasha Jipusip, all pure land Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all holy beings, we've invoked the divine and Tao. Thank you to all our spiritual transmissions, Master Shah for being a great master and vessel and servant. Thank you to each other. We love each other. This is our virtual Sangha. We're very grateful for you all. I love you all. Let me say how, how, how. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you, love you, love you. Gong song, gong song, gong song. I'm going to stop the recording.